Hi everybody, Lawrence Moroni here. I'm at TensorFlow World and we've just come from the keynote that was given by Jeff Dean. And uh, so Jeff, welcome and thanks for coming to talk with us. Thanks for having me. So you covered lots of great content in the keynote and there was there's so many things that we don't have time to go over them all, but there was one really impactful thing that I saw. And you were talking about like in computer vision, the way now the error rate in humans is like 5% in computer vision and now with machines it's down to 3% and that's really, really cool. But it's more than just a number, right? What's the impact of this? Right, I mean, it's important to understand this is for a particular task right. that you know humans aren't necessarily that great at. You have to be able to distinguish 40 species of dogs and yeah. other kinds yeah. of things in a thousand categories. But I do think the progress we've made from about 26% error in 2011 down to 3% in 2016 is hugely impactful because uh, the way I like to think about it is computers have now evolved eyes that work, <laughs> right? Yeah, and yeah. so we've now got the ability for computers to perceive the world around them in ways that, that didn't exist six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden that opens up applications of computing that just didn't exist before because now you can depend on being able to see and sense what's around you. Right, I know one of these applications that you're always passionate about is diabetic retinopathy and you know diagnosis of that. Could you tell us what's going on in that space? Yeah, I mean, I think diabetic retinopathy is like a really good uh, example of many medical imaging fields where now all of a sudden, if you collect a high quality data set from you know, domain experts, you know, uh, radiologists labeling x-rays or ophthalmologists labeling eye images, mm -hmm. and then you train uh, a computer vision model on that task, whatever it might be, you can now sort of replicate the expertise of those, those domain experts in a way that makes it possible to bring and deploy that, that sort of expertise much more widely. You can get something onto a, a GPU card and do 100 right. images a second in a rural village uh, all over the world. And, and I think that's the important part. It's like places where there's shortage of that expertise, you can now have impact to change the world. That's right, yeah, yeah. So you can ha offer, if you have cl clinicians who are already doing this task, you can offer them like an instant second opinion, like a second colleague that they right. can turn to. Uh, but you can also deploy it in places where there are just aren't enough doctors. Yeah, it, it, I just find that amazing, and it's one of the ways that computer vision is now like more than just a number, right? It's a, it's an application that we're able to do to change yeah. the world and make it a better. I mean, place. being able to see has all <laughs> kinds of cool <laughs> implications. <so. laughs> exactly, and then you also spoke <coughs> a lot about language and some of the new language models and some of the research that's been going on into there. And can you can you update us a little on that? Sure. I mean, I think in the last four or so years, we've made a lot of progress as a community in how do we build models that can basically understand pieces of text, you know, things like paragraph or a couple paragraphs long. We can actually understand them at a much deeper level than we were used, able to do before. We still don't have a good handle on how do we like read an entire book and understand that at a, at a way a human would get from reading a book. But understanding a few paragraphs of text is actually a pretty fundamental, fundamentally useful thing for all kinds of things. You know, it can use, be used to improve our search mm -hmm. system. You know, just last week we announced the use of a BERT model, which is a sort of fairly sophisticated natural language processing model right. in the middle of our search ranking algorithms. Uh, and that's been shown to improve our search results quite a lot for lots of different kinds of queries that were previously pretty hard. Cool, cool. And I'm <coughs> assuming can be used, for example, for like uh, the research, at least for translation, for bringing more languages online. For that yeah, yeah. So too. there's also a lot of advances in the field of translation using these kinds of models, transformer-based models uh, for translation uh, are showing like remarkable gains in in uh, blue score, which is a measure of translation quality. Right, right. Now, one thing that I found particularly fascinating that you were talking about as you were wrapping up your keynote is that a lot of time we have these kind of atomic models that all do that do all these unit tasks. But what about this great big model, like to be able to do multiple things and using neural architecture search to be able to add to that model? And could you elaborate a little bit on that? Cause sure. You had a great call to action there. Yeah, I mean, I think you know today in the machine learning field we mostly find a problem we care about. Mm -hmm. We find the right data to train a model to do that particular task. But we usually start from nothing with that model. We basically initialize the parameters of the model with random floating point numbers, and then try to learn everything about that task from the data set we've collected. Mm -hmm. And that seems pretty unrealistic. It's sort of akin to like when you want to learn to do something new, you forget all your education, <laughs> exactly. and you go back Take to being an out, infant, put a different brain in. <laughs> and now you try to learn everything about this task. Yeah. And that's going to require that you have a lot more examples of mm -hmm. what it is you're trying to do, because you're not generalizing from all the other things you already know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also going to mean you need a lot more computation uh, and a lot more sort of uh, effort to, to achieve good 
good outcomes in this mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. If instead you had a model that knew how to do lots and lots of things, you know, in the limit, all the things we're training separate machine learning models for, why aren't we training one large model for this with different pieces of expertise that mm -hmm. are, you know, I think it's really important that if we have a large model that we only sort of sparsely activate it. We call upon different pieces of it as needed, but mostly, you know, 99% of the model is idle for any given task. Right. And you call upon the right pieces of expertise when you need them. Yep. And that I think is a promising direction. There's a lot of really interesting computer systems problems underneath there. How do we actually scale to a model of that size? Um, there's a lot of interesting machine learning research questions. How do we sort of have a model that evolves its structure that like uh, learns to route to different pieces of the model that are most appropriate? Um, it, but I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, me too. And it's like it's one of those things that <coughs> might seem a little fantastical now, but only two or three or four years ago, the computer vision and natural language stuff that we were talking about seemed fantastical then. So it's right, and we're seeing hints of like things like neural architecture search seems to work well for things. We're seeing the fact that you know when you do transfer learning from another related task, you know you generally get good results with less data for the mm -hmm. final task you care about. Uh, multitask learning at small scales of like five or six related things right. all tend to make things work well. So this is just sort of the logical consequence of, of yeah. like extending all those ideas out. Yeah, exactly. And it's um, so then like bringing it back, for example, to the computer vision that we spoke about earlier on. It was like who, who would have thought that when we were first researching that that things like diabetic retinopathy would have been possible. And now we're at the point where with this like model, this I don't know what to call it, model of everything, Uber model, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There, there were going to be <coughs> applications for that. That can change the world. That can make the world a better place. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the hope. <laughs> that's the hope, <laughs> and, uh, and that's also the driving goal, I think, and that's one of the things that I find. And if we go back to your keynote, like towards the end of your keynote, when you spoke about fairness, when you spoke about you know, the engineering challenges that we're helping to solve, and that too was personally inspiring to me. Hmm. Cool. So, yeah, yeah. And I hope it's personally inspiring to you, too. So thanks so much, Jeff. I really appreciate having you on. And, uh, thanks very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.